Welcome to episode 80 of the Mountain Mantras Wellness and Life Lessons Podcast. This podcast aims to inspire you with wellness and performance tips that you can incorporate into your daily life. I'm your host, Katherine Guilet. Learn more about my work at makeeverythingfun.com. And I'm laughing a little bit because I'm going to introduce my guest in just a minute, but we were... We were talking about how serious the context is of this interview today. We will be talking about COVID-19 and what's happening in this world. When I read Deb Antonori's short bio, you'll be seeing how her expertise in the brain spotting world, she's an expert in brain science. We were going through some incredible nuggets already that I want to have her share with you. She's got her brain model, brain stem model all ready to go. But we're also talking about how important it is to understand that when our brain is in this fear mode and we are not able to access the higher parts of our brain, which we'll talk about if you're not tracking what I'm saying right now, it's important that we become more vulnerable. Our immune systems are actually more vulnerable when we're in fear because we're in this survival state. So this is really here as a humanitarian effort to get the word out about how brain spotting and about how Deb's expertise in grief counseling can really help you today. So thank you for your attention. And I'm going to tell you a little bit more about Deb Antonori. Deb is an author, narrator, and licensed professional grief counselor with 29 years of experience in private practice, as well as a brain spotting trainer and certified consultant. She was originally supervised by the developer of brain spotting, David Grant. And I'll just insert right there that I'll be interviewing him in just a couple of days about what's happening right now in the world. And so we're going to kind of get into this whole system of the brain and the brain body system and how we can understand and be more aware of it so we can have it serve us a little bit better as we go through these challenging times. And she has been working, Deb has been working with brain spotting since 2003. So she's a true expert in this field. We'll talk about how she's also also an author and a contributor to an anthology about brain spotting, which is fabulous. Um, And she continues to expand her studies around the world today. So thank you, Deb, for joining me. Oh, my delight. Thank you so much, Catherine. And I I mentioned the context of COVID-19, and it's interesting. You work, uh, your practice is in New York City, which has been an epicenter in that whole tri-state area is under quite a lot of duress right now. And it's interesting, there was a a news article that came out this weekend talking about where I live, which is Sun Valley, Idaho, a teeny tiny mountain town, has the same amount of density or more in terms of cases of COVID. So we are under a lot of stress, and we're going to talk about what that does in the brain. Um, So I'm going to let people, and I'm going to put in the show notes, Deb, I'm going to put your full bio because you truly have an extensive background in in brain science and obviously grief counseling. But as we were in our pre-interview chat, you pulled out the brain and I'm like, oh, this is so cool because we're also doing this as video. If you want to just talk people through the different parts of the brain, you talked about the three parts and sort of how we might be shifting into a more you know, base or primal part of our brains at this point and how we need to be aware and careful so that we can manage that. Do you want to start with the brain? Sure, sure. Thanks, Catherine. Yes, so we all have a brain and brains are evolutionarily programmed for us to survive. So I always say that there's the three things the brain likes. First is survival. And when that's taken care of, then there's homeostasis, and then conserving energy or restoration. So right now we're in a mode where uh, really, I would say most of us are in a type of survival mode. This is different than anything we've ever known before. And so we're very challenged in our thinking, analytical brain. Um, Even as it interfaces with language, you may have trouble catching words here or there, or you may be listening to someone and ask them, could you repeat that? I just kind of went somewhere. That this is what's going to happen when we have one of these, as David Grand will talk about, existential traumas. Like um, with 9-11, when it affects everyone, and this one particularly, that this virus uh, will not discriminate in any way, shape, or form, Um, It is a a deadly virus. Of course, people do survive it, but our deeper brain, and that would be, as we're looking at the brain here, it's going to be, turn it around, 
the brainstem area where our survival circuits are held. So what I talked about before was this thinking rational part of the brain. And I have the wrong side of the brain here. For those who know the brain well, this is the right side, but my left side sort of falls apart. It comes apart in pieces. So we'll pretend this is the left side. And this would be that part, the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex. And that is the part that has to do with executive functioning, thinking, um, planning goals, decisions, understanding consequences. All of that is in this little part of our brain here. And it has only one indirect connection down to the survival circuits in the brain. So that's in the brain stem, but also in our limbic system or mammalian brain, you may have heard of that. That's in this area here. And the amygdala, which many people have heard of, is in this part of the brain. And that's the original assessor. Are things safe and warm or I'm not sure? Or, oh boy, this is really bad. This is threat to my life. So if that happens, the amygdala then signals the hypothalamus, which is just above the brain stem. And that will start that HPA access. That's hypothalamus and you're shaking your head. Mm -hmm. Yes, pituitary to adrenal. And then we get, oh, cortisol. Wonderful if we need to run really fast, to get away, to flee, or if we need to fight to the death, or we were just talking about um, these crazy things you hear that a mother lifts the car, the back end of the car up just enough to be able to get her toddler out from, from underneath. This is the cortisol and the norepinephrine, another stress chemical, but helpful in times of survival issues. Now, this is fine as long as the threat is there, but we were devised uh, neurobiologically way, way back when, hundreds of thousands of years, we still have that same neurobiology that the event is supposed to happen um, that is challenging. And then cortisol is supposed to drop back to normal because that event is over. So obviously much more complex, different type of society we have today. And certainly since really the industrial revolution. We live closer together to each other. We have all kinds of technology, all kinds of different ways that can signal to us that survival is at stake, losing a job, um, a divorce. Many kinds of things can challenge us that isn't like the grizzly bear coming towards us or we're running really fast and all of a sudden we see the edge of a cliff like our ancestors might have. And once that event is over for them, their cortisol level, as I said, comes back to normal. But for us, if that cortisol keeps going, it can actually eat away at the hippocampus. And that's our friend, that's our reality tester, that's our explicit memory maker that comes online around age three. So at that point, we can remember things that happen in time and in context, whereas before, the amygdala is our assessor. As I said before, safe and warm or not, threatening or not, and then it will signal if it's threatening that hypothalamus up here and the PAG in the brainstem, and that's what holds, and get out my brainstem model, that's what holds the survival programs of fight, flight, freeze, faint, uh, and dissociation. Ruth Lanius did a study in 2016 showing that dissociation uh, actually is housed or begins in the PAG, the periaqueductal gray in the brainstem. And where that is, it's in this area. This is the midbrain. Here's our brainstem. This up here is not part of it. That's the thalamus. So we'll pretend this part isn't here. But here's our medulla that connects to the spinal cord. Here's the pons. It's kind of roundish. It connects us to the cerebellum. And then the midbrain, a lot of people think the midbrain is the center of the, the brain where the limbic system is, but it's the actual name of the top of the brain stem. And for those who are brain spotting therapists, we have our superior and inferior colliculus here. So they'll know about that. And right, right behind that is our periaqueductal gray that holds these survival programs. So this is what we're going to be experiencing in this time of COVID is that those programs are going to get uh, triggered and kindled by 
watching the news or by the fact that um, you can call your best friend or see him or her on uh, Zoom here or whatever you might want to use, but it's not the same as being right there with someone. And um, we have when we have these wonderful chemicals, the feel-good chemicals of oxytocin. It's like the warm fires burning, your heart is warmed by your beloved or your best friend or your dog. Um, and, uh, the dog may be with you, but your best friend may be at a distance for quite a while or your mom or your grandmother, your coworkers, people that, you know, on an everyday basis. So, um, your, your, um, limbic system that is really made for bonding and attachment, there's real challenges there. So, um, we're going to find that each person is different in their response David talks about, uh, David Grant talks about uh, 9-11 being an existential trauma. We all experienced it. It changed things in our country, not just in New York City and in Pennsylvania and in Washington, D.C., where the planes crashed, but all over the country, things changed. So this COVID-19 is a change that is affecting all of us for the immediate for our lives, um, that we keep our lives and that we quarantine ourselves as best we can, but that every day of our life, um, Therese Rando talks about the assumptive world. So that's yourself, your friends, your family, relationships, the world and everyone and everything in it. Just what you, when you get up in the morning, think before we started this with COVID, you get up, you have your cup of coffee, Hey, now maybe there's no coffee on the shelves in the grocery store when you feel safe enough to go in. Um, you go to work. Well, you're not going to work now. You um, are in a very different situation. You go to the gym. You're not going to the gym. You're maybe watching a Pilates video online and doing that. So that the assumptive world is really turned on its head. And this happens to us in grief when the beloved, when our mom, our dad, our spouse, our child, whoever may pass away, it can feel as though the rug has been completely pulled out from under us. And even though all those things are in place that during COVID we, we don't have, it can feel so impactful. It can feel like the world has imploded. So we were talking about speaking about you know, COVID and then also kind of generally with grief. Um, that this mammalian brain of ours that we really are um, designed to uh, bond and to feel good with each other. Um, it's one of the evolutionary perspectives, um, genetic imperatives that if we hadn't, I mean, look at us, we're, we're ridiculous humans. We have our little paper thin skin, our little chiclet teeth, I got some Invisalign, so now they're a little straighter. Oh, maybe then you want to whiten them. And <laughs> our nails, maybe you go and get your nails done. Well, look at a, a mammal that has a hide and fangs and claws. Um, they are set up very differently that maybe they can have a smaller clan or uh, many mammals, of course, are um, uh, um, pack animals but we really had to be a pack animal or we never would have survived nature, the environment, whatever. It's almost amazing that we did survive and it is uh, due to our brain and very much our neocortical brain. And when it's in good sync with um, our subcortical brain as well. So these are some of the things I'm thinking in this, in this time of COVID. And Deb, and thank you so much for reminding us that, and I'm going to just put this as mantra number one, that we need to be gentle with ourselves right now. Because of what you were just describing, it reminded me of, you know, when I read Dr. Norman Deutsch's book, and it's about, it's not sometimes about us, like as how we behave and all that. It's about our brain. Like our brain actually serves a primary purpose of survival. And so we have to understand that hierarchy that you described of survival, then homeostasis, then the restoration and conserving en um, energy. I also wanted to make it as a mantra that we are in a state of existential trauma. 
So those listeners, and I've done, I don't know, maybe two dozen interviews of brain spotting practitioners, and we've brought up again and again. So what does trauma mean? You know, we've talked about the different variations, uh, anything that's uh, less than nurturing to your nervous system. It doesn't necessarily have to be uh, during a time of war or, you know, experiencing a natural, natural disaster. But just that statement or that mantra of we are in a state of existential trauma puts us all in that uh, category together. And so that we need to recognize that system that you talked about, which is the parts of the brain then relate to that HPA axis, which then, you know, ends up with the adrenal glands producing more cortisol. So that's kind of where I wanted to go, Deb, in, in this discussion. And of course, like, I'm so glad when you were talking about the PAG that I just took a class in neuroanatomy, <laughs> but uh, I wanted to talk about sort of some actionable steps because we are now understanding as listeners, and there's a lot of brain spotting practitioners that are going to listen, but also people in the general public that are learning about this. And, you know, they know that the cortisol, the cortisol hormone is going to, you know, it's related to stress, right? And so how do we manage that? Because we as human beings are not designed to be in chronic stress. We are designed to be in short-term stress. And so that we can do things like lift cars and things like that, or run really fast or fight or flight. Um, but this cortisol could get a little bit out of control with that HPA access, which is a feedback loop. How do we start to bring awareness to what we've already talked about? And then in particular, managing our cortisol levels. You mentioned oxytocin. So I think that that might be a, a little bit of where we're going. But as a, an expert in this area, what would you suggest in, in terms of some things, maybe self-care, meditation, mindfulness? I'll let you take it from there. Absolutely, Catherine. I think you've, you've hit it right on the head. Those practices that you do that for you uh, make you a, a best friend to yourself, the way that you sort of bond or know yourself, if you like meditation, if you do yoga or Pilates, if you like to draw and paint. Me, I'm a big knitter, so I've been doing a lot of knitting. Um, things that you enjoy doing that um, restore your soul in a way and that you can do um, alone, but that maybe you could get on Zoom and get a few of your friends together. And whether you watch a Pilates, um, somebody has the Pilates and you do it together or whether a couple friends like to knit or crochet or whatever it might be. Um, maybe there's something you've always wanted, a book you've always wanted to read or something you've always wanted to learn to keep your neocortical brain, give it a little bit of an intentional focus somewhere that has an interest or a draw to you. Maybe not the thing so much you think you should do, but right now it's like, ooh, what have I wanted to do that I haven't kind of let myself do? And that can sort of help to give to give you a bit of, we need some distraction too. If there's certain TV shows that you like, you like to watch uh, reruns of Friends or um, uh, something enjoyable that uh, really you, you like a lot. Thinking again of being your own best friend because I'm gonna do this little hand model of Dan Siegel's here now. We were doing this before that if this is your brain, this is a hemisphere, this is your spinal cord, and this is your brain stem, this would represent that mammalian brain limbic system with that amygdala in there that has that sensing and that assessing of what's going on in the environment. And then this is the neocortex. And then what do we have? Whoop, under here, we have these middle prefrontal circuits. And what these are, they're different than that dorsolateral prefrontal cortex that thinks and has uh, rationalizes things, plans, has goals. This part is a lot has to do with um, bonding, um, with social understanding, social cues. And this is what can calm down those um, alarm centers in our brain, which are the amygdala that will then, if it assesses, this is enough of a threat. Remember our survival, then homeostasis, then restoration. Well, if it assesses threat, what happens oftentimes is if we have the two halves of the brain, this is Dan Siegel's model, we're really scared, we're really angry, we, whoop, we flip our lid. So for those that are listening and not looking, I just opened my hands up 
and my fingers are off of my thumb and palm area so that that poor little amygdala is left to defend for itself. And so it is probably signaling our hypothalamus, that hypothalamus to pituitary to adrenal access and then that cortisol is running. And then that PAG in the brainstem, which is as we had spoken before about being right behind this area here in that midbrain with our survival programs, fight, flight, freeze, faint, dissociation. And I think that um, there may be times that we zone out and that's fine. And dissociation really has a function. It's to give a cushion for us that we can't be on all the time. So as you had said, being kind to yourself, if you notice that you're zoning out or if you drove to the grocery store and you missed the exit, don't think, oh no, what's wrong with me? I'm, I, there's really something terribly wrong. It's like, no, you went into kind of a little survival place and got into your own world. And that's normal under these circumstances. Normalize as much as you can for yourself that things are going to be different for you. I'll tell you, I had cancer last year and I, um, when I was um, um, having chemo, I really, it really was like, oh my gosh, that chemo brain thing is a real thing. I love the brain. I study the brain. I would look at the material. I couldn't absorb one word. So of course it was the chemical, but it was also, my system was kind of hyped up from what I was going through. So know that the chemicals that your own system can put out can make you feel as though, oh no, I'm not at my norm. I'm working from home, but why, why isn't this draft or whatever looking as good as I usually do? That's where you have to really have, have some compassion for yourself and do what you need to. Maybe contact a friend then. Here, now you're at home. So maybe you text your friend and say, hey, do you have a minute? And oh my gosh, this draft. And maybe you need to hear from someone. Hey, you're great at that. If, you know, that's all right. That's one draft. You know, don't worry about it. You'll come up with it when you need the cheerleading. We may need some cheerleading from each other. It's wonderful when we can generate it ourselves. But in this time that's so difficult, that interdependency that we have as, as mammals and as human beings, it's really important to re and reach out not only to help others, and I think therapists are so geared that way, and they found that it's actually a different stream, a different um, neural pathway to give it out than to bring it back towards yourself. So keeping that in mind, that um, taking care of yourself is going to be, be really important because I'm sure everyone who's listening is really good at taking care of other people. And it's really important to remember, um, you know, even that the precious child inside that you have, this kind of trauma can bring up those traumas from other times in our life that go back so that those inner children inside of us, different ages, different times, different things that we went through are going to get peaked and triggered and may have messages for us that may not be feeling uh, great when they come through. But um, that's where too, if you can trade sessions as therapists with each other, if, whether it's brain spotting sessions for brain spotting therapists or other therapists who are listening, if there are th things that you can do to help each other to come together as a community to get through this together. And I think that's what so much helps to bring these circuits back down, these middle prefrontal circuits that say, okay, you know, I am okay in the world. I'm doing the things to be safe. I'm connected to my family and friends as best as I can be in this time. And that I'm learning something about myself in this time that given all those things I, in my assumptive world, I sort of took for granted may give all of us a new sense of what really means so much, being able to just put your hand on the shoulder of a friend or, you know, to look deeply into the real eyes, you know, of uh, your, your mom who lives, you know, in another state, whatever it may be. So um, I think it is a time 
for pause and for working with our brains the best that we can and trusting them that they, they're really working. They really want us to get to this homeostasis and they want us to be in this restoration. So whatever we can do to help that survival piece of, am I really in that threatening of a situation in this moment? To see if we can, from our hippocampus, maybe even pull out a memory of something that, is there something we can remember from another time? Sue Pinko did this in a group the other day. She's another brain spotting trainer. And it was so wonderful. People were able to pull on memories of when they felt strong in their core, either when they were helping someone else or they were on vacation or whatever it might be. They were bathing themselves, bathing their, their neurons and their frayed nerves in a memory of something that was and that hopefully will be able to be again. It makes me think of Viktor Frankl, his uh, book, The a Search for Meaning. He was a um, concentration camp survivor. And he said that who he thought were the people that were so, uh, surviving were the ones who could see something life beyond the prison camp. They could see it, they could feel it somewhere inside themselves and they were able, they were able to survive. And of course there was terrible, the worst conditions that we could ever, ever possibly imagine. Um, but I thought of that book and of his message with that, that it's okay to dream forward a little bit of something we might like to do. And maybe when this period is over, what might be something fun, either with friends that we say, oh, I'm working too much. I got to do this or I got to do that. I got to get this, roll out this training. I've got to, uh, oh, I wanted to write a book, whatever it may be for us, that maybe there are some things that we put to the side, having fun, really relating with other people. Um, or maybe it is writing that book. <laughs> you know, it's different for each person. So um, uh, I'm, I'm also thinking about um, that Jack Panksup is a wonderful, um, uh, he was a wonderful neuroscientist. He passed a couple of years ago and he uh, fathered, uh, discovered a field called effective neuroscience. And his book is called Effective Neuroscience, The Foundations of Human and Animal Emotions. And he looks at different primal circuits care, um, grief, grief, panic, and anxiety are one circuit and fear is a separate circuit. They are two distinct neurochemical and neuroanatomical pathways. So that this is another reason to really take good care of ourselves. We've got two whammies here. The fear is that area that I talked about of the amygdala and the assessing then to the hypothalamus if it's survival and the PAG for the um, survival programs and that hypothalamus contacting down then to the um, adrenal and running cortisol. That's dread, fear, terror. Then we have the panic circuit, panic, grief, and separation anxiety. And that comes again very much from that relational part of us that um, it was found with distress vocalizations from little animals when they were removed from their mothers. These cries that they would make um, were to try to have the parent return, but they found that these little animals after a certain period would stop that cry and they would go into a, a state almost like hibernation, almost like torpor where their respiration goes down and their body temperature gets a little bit cooler to try not to signal predators in the area that they're there and to conserve energy. And Jack Panksepp said, this may be the seeds of depression, that that degree of then social isolation, that if you take it to that um, kind of uh, thought with individuals, that they're away that long from their social circuit, their social rather, um, you know, uh, uh, group of, of people that, um, that they take um, so much uh, from that feels good, where the oxytocin is flowing, and the endogenous opioids. And if you think of someone that never had that to begin with, this is where we can see, of course, a lot of the problems that people will come in, in to see us. But when you see those two circuits, that separation that we have right now from people that um, uh, 
that can make for that kind of anxiety feeling. So you've got two streams that can make you kind of scared or anxious, even yearning, sad and lonely. And how they saw this, uh, these two distinct pathways, was in the 60s with the early antidepressant uh, imipramine. It would um, address the number of panic attacks, but not the fear of having them again. So what would happen in this study, a patient would come into the office and see the psychiatrist. And um, the psychiatrist would say, oh, how are you doing? And they say, oh, not good. I'm not doing good at all. And he'd say, well, how many panic attacks did you have this week? Three. And the psychiatrist would say, wait a minute, I'm looking back at your chart. And there was 10, there were 10 panic attacks. And before that it was 12. The patient says, oh, yeah, but I'm always afraid the next one's going to be coming. So there was that dread, that fear, that rumination, even though the number of panic attacks had gone down. And however, with another chemical, with um, benzodiazepines, um, they find that that dread and that fear may be quelled, that you know people may be feeling better, but they may tell you that they've had 10 panic attacks this week, but their concern about having them may not be as great. Nevertheless, in those 10 moments, they were not feeling so well. So this is how these two kind of channels were um, discovered and why it is such a hard thing with anxiety for people and anxiety and depression and finding uh, the right med and also um, working with um, a therapy in the way that really helps. This is why I believe being a brain spotting trainer, why brain spotting is so helpful because it is a neurobiological way of working and works with our visual field. And that's where one of our um, theories is that our midbrain in our midbrain is this superior colliculus that we think that we're getting this particular stream, this retinocollicular pathway. There are several visual pathways, but the fast track pathway, the one that has to do with survival is the retinocollicular pathway. And this is what Frank Corrigan, who wrote um, the article in Medical Hypotheses with David Grand called Recruiting the Midbrain Circuits. This is where he hypothesized we are getting contact in this part of the brain. So this is about orienting. So once we have visually oriented, then the head and the neck and the shoulders, that is in the superior colliculus, as are other senses. It's the first um, neural area where we have multimodal integration in the brain. So it's a very important part um, of our brain in helping us to orient, to survive, to something that is threatening. So again, it's our theory that when we have brain spotting, we say we set the frame and we have a focus of what we notice in our body. And we see if we can maybe give that a number, 10 being the worst and zero, nothing. We can sort of get a frame of what we're working on and then we see where in the visual field, there's a resonance where we're looking is how we're feeling. And that's the brain spot. So this is the place that we're saying we are getting a bookmark into the midbrain. And the midbrain is where Jack Panksepp, our effective neuroscience um, father, says that we don't get the kind of neuroplastic change we want unless we have contact during the therapy into the midbrain. And so this is what Frank Corrigan was writing about is he believes that why brain spotting seems to work as well as it does is that we're getting the contact in this area of the brain that helps us to make those neuroplastic long lasting changes in the brain. Um, mm, it's so important. And I might put something in the show notes, mm -hmm. Deb, about how the neurotube splits into the diencephalon and then the telencephalon and, and how th that actually, it, it biologically and anatomically connects the brain and the central nervous system to the eyes. In fact, when you look into somebody's eyes or when you're connecting with an eye gaze, um, you're actually accessing the nervous system. And I, and I want to talk a little bit because you started to get into how brain spotting works. And I want to go there, but I just want to remind people that this is all about how we need to calm 
our brains, which are in an alarm state right now, just kind of bringing back to what this is all about. And, and folks can listen. I recently interviewed Dr. Mario Martinez, and he's a leader in the world of PNI or psychoneuro and immunology. Big word, but it has to talk with how the brain body system affects your immune system, which is really important right now. He's yeah. on my Positive on Publishing podcast episode 62, but the reason why I wanted to frame what we're going to go into, which is I hope a little bit of a self-spotting exercise for listeners, yes. is that he talks about how healing cannot, and he goes into brain waves, healing cannot occur in a, in a beta brainwave state. So it's like we have to get into a deeper, you know, more contemplative or alpha theta state for the real healing in the brain body system to occur. And I think, because we're kind of talking about theories, we know brain spotting works and there's lots of evidence and science to back it, but there's also sort of theories about what the <coughs> pathways are and how the pathways work. Hi, I'm just creating a short clip um, to frame the rest of the interview. Deb and I went on to do a self-spotting exercise, which we thought would be better serving the public by having it as a separate file. So we're going to go right to the end of this audio file and this video file, but you can find the separate self-spotting exercise, which we think will be so helpful for people at makeeverythingfun.com podcasts. So it's for forward slash podcasts and she's under the mountain mantras podcast. And so you can find in the show notes, we will have a link uh, to uh, that separate file. And also on the YouTube channel, it will exist as a separate video and that's YouTube. The channel is called make everything fun. So hopefully you can subscribe and be part of all the great videos that we're putting out right now. Now we're going to the end. Thanks. If you do feel yourself in a difficult place, being able to be given that, okay, that's there, but what else might be there too, but your attentional circuits just aren't on it. So this resource, this body resource gives our brain a shift like um, per perspective to, oh, this area like, oh, okay, all along here on my arm feels okay. We weren't aware of that before. And then getting the brain spot, the place where we're looking, that affects how we feel, where you look affects how you feel, we're going into a softer place, a more gentle place in this whole um, thing of who we are and what we feel and in this particular time of COVID-19. Um, it's something that we can return to. You may find at different times that different parts of your body feel more like, oh, this part actually feels really good, or I feel very stirred up all over, but somehow just the bridge of my, you know, my nose way up high seems quiet. That, that good, you found a little place and that you can get the brain spot for that, just to help to encourage your brain to bring those circuits back down those middle prefrontal circuits and make a little hug around your amygdala to say, it's okay. We're in the house right now. There's nothing you can do about the toilet paper or whatever it may be. <laughs> You're okay. And um, be able to help train our brains a bit, you know, because it is that fire together, wire together, that Hebb's axiom that the more we do this sort of work and just like our meditation or whatever else helps us to feel good, the more we do this resource brain spotting in this period of time will help our brains to find that pathway a little more facilely and a little more quickly. And hopefully you'll enjoy it. And maybe you do have that bilateral sound on the oceanic feelings or something else that you really like. Um, and you can have that on. And even, even just doing it for five or 10 minutes can be very restorative and um, very helpful. Mm, well, well, thank you so much, Deb. And I'm gonna give you some time to allow listeners to find you online and visit your website and learn about your practice. And of course, people can go to brainspotting.com to learn more about the modality overall. I guess just in, in closing, I will say that one of the things I've been contemplating is that I understand how, how grave the situation is with COVID. I'm not in any way um, undervaluing the impact and the grief and sorrow and the you know other feelings like anxiety and 
panic that we might, and fear that we might, on different pathways there, that we might be feeling. But what we can see is that in some ways, is sort of a paradigm shift for the world. Yeah. Everything is changing. You talked about it as the you know assumptive world, right? It's being turned on its head. And it's kind of like this paradigm shift where if you are an actress, and I know you have a background as, you know, as a, as a performer, it's like there's a whole set that's put up around that world, that assumptive world. And when the stage is over and there's a shift, a paradigm shift, the whole thing is taken down and the stage is swept. And then it's time to put up a new stage, a new show. And that's the new paradigm that we're moving into. And so I just wanted to remind listeners that through these practices of brain spotting through this self-care through the being gentle with yourself and sure understanding the brain body system just a little bit more so we can take some pressure off but also have some tools to get all the alarm states it puts us in a better position to create that new world in this paradigm shift that we want to be part of and what our role is going to be in this new world so it's just sort of a gentle but profound call to action to everyone watching, to everyone listening about how this is a paradigm shift and, and how this can be in some ways an opportunity for a fresh start. Yes, I just love how you said that, Catherine. Absolutely. I think um, kind of that Victor Frankl, man's search for meaning that how, how do we move forward? Um, how do we be with where we are now and then in our moving forward? Um, I think is very important. So tools of brain spotting can be so helpful um, to us as uh, other tools for other therapists who are listening um, to us as well. Um, so people can find me at my website, which is, um, it's, it's a little funny. It's um, www.petlossaudio.com. So when you lose your animal, when your animal dies, pet loss, L-O-S-S, audio.com. I have an audio book on pet loss called Journey Through Pet Loss. And that's, <laughs> yes, where um, I kind of have my website there and have my uh, pages on brain spotting and brain spotting trainings there. I have my email down there. Um, please be in touch with me, and particularly in this time. You know, if there's anything you want to let me know or, or just connect, I'm very happy to do that. And I really appreciate people uh, listening. I'm so passionate about the brain. I just, I really love to learn about it. I've learned so much from um, recently in the last few years, Demir Del Monte. Um, oh, I, I cannot say enough about his work and what a wonderful teacher he is and how generous and kind and, and um, just terrific he has been with the brain spotting community. So, and of course, David Grant I mean, goes without saying. <laughs> We're big fans, aren't we? Yes. <laughs> oh, all right. Well, I will put that link in the show notes. I'll put your full bio because you're such a rock star. I'll also put uh, a link to the brain spotting book. So David Grant has two books and then there's also the anthology, which you contributed a beautiful chapter to. So I'll put that on the show notes. And if you're watching the video version of this, I'll make sure to put that all under the video. So thank you, Deb, for joining us today, for sharing your wisdom and your healing with us. We so appreciate you. Oh, thank you very much, Catherine. I really appreciate it.